Welcome to episode 133 of... I thought you were just going to blurt out like Mary Shoes or something. You were saying? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Welcome to episode 133 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. I'm so easy. Take three. Yeah, take three. Sorry to our viewers on YouTube, or maybe not sorry. Maybe you like the bloopers. Maybe that's why oh, you yeah. tune into the video version of this. Um, anyway, welcome to episode 133 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. T today, I am. Oh my God. Wow, this is awesome. Jeez. All right. to our viewers on youtube we apologize but also maybe not apologize because this is the right, we'll, play it, we'll play it we'll play it straight this time see if you can figure this thing out all right enjoy yourself enjoy yourself knock yourself out go welcome to episode 133 of the civil war breakfast club podcast i am your co-host mary and today i am joined by darren the most awesome civil war nerd i know because i cannot for the life of me uh do an intro like he does and i don't even try anymore because i can't i tried once and it just fell flat so anyway here we are episode 133 um we are back recording where we usually do in plymouth um after being able to record for the first time ever like on site somewhere which was really really awesome at grant hall a few weeks ago but anyway darren how are you Oh my goodness gracious! That fantastic. That was the best intro we've ever done by far. Not even close. It was pretty good. It was like a, it was a thing. So Terrible. anyway, so yeah. So good point. It is good to be back here in the saddle again, back in the, uh, back in Massachusetts doing this episode. So yeah. So this is um, this is nice to be back talking about battles. We got some fun stuff to talk about this evening, Mary. We do. Yes, we do. But first, before we get to that, what are you drinking? I'm stunned that you, you remember. Thank you so much for asking. I am drinking. It is the great. Narragansett beer, Mary from oh, Rhode Island, and I'm Jaws. drinking it. I'm drinking it today because of the anniversary of Jaws is coming up, yeah. and so what better cup to drink it out of than my I'm the reason my country music is so sad, William T. Sherman mug, <laughs> because he was called the Land Shark at one point, Mary. He you was. may have heard that, so that's why I picked the mug. So, anywho, how about you? I am drinking Support Local, which is by a local brewery here in Plymouth called uh, um, Mayflower Brewing. Um, it's very good. It's obviously an IPA. But if I run out of that, I do have a Narragansett in my Jaws koozie. Oh, excellent. As excellent. well. Yeah, so there well, we go. But it is good to be back. Admittedly, it is. And, you know, today we're talking about a battle that was really the nail in the coffin for the Confederacy in stopping William G. Sherman from taking that pivotal supply hub and manufacturing center of Atlanta, Georgia, in the summer of 1864. Now, We'll talk more about the battle, but it, the battle was a culmination of the Union Army's 1864 Summer of Love that started in Chattanooga mm -hmm. on May 7th. And, and by July, Sherman was on the on Atlanta's doorsteps. It was causing more anxiety to the Atlanta to the Atlanta citizens than Tom Brady with the ball in overtime. And it was. So, but not only did Sherman's monstrous army of over 110,000 people push through Joseph E. Johnson's 60,000 Army of Tennessee. It also caused a huge political ripple effect uh, in that army that basically caused a command change at arguably the worst time and had the worst effects on the Confederacy for the rest of the war. Yep. To me, it is. this is just my opinion, but it is probably one of the more, it's the command change that makes me kind of, I'm like, why would you do that? And it's probably, and I think, uh, you know, I know a few other people that feel that way too, but as you were saying, this is part of Sherman's Atlanta campaign, which began in May, 1864. And it's following the victories that secured the city of Chattanooga in November of 1863. And that's a really important victory for the union because now the gateway is open for them to get to Atlanta and further and further into the Confederacy. The other thing to note about 1864 is that it's an election year. So securing the city of Atlanta is important, but it is not the only thing going on in 1864. By this point in 1864, when the Battle of Peachtree Creek, which we're going to be talking about, happens, the Battle of Monocacy has always had has already happened, which is the battle that saved Washington, D.C. Thank you, Lou Wallace. Um, and then Sheridan, General Sheridan in the Valley, is also going to play a bit of a role in what is going to secure the 1864 election for President Abraham Lincoln. And the campaign and, is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask 
And let's not forget what's going on with the campaign, Mayor. U.S. Grant is up in at all the you all moving all the same. We're not Sherman's Atlanta campaign in, in detail, but basically, in a nutshell, you know, Sherman's army moves through Georgia, and when he ran into rebel resistance at places like Resaca, Dallas, Kennesaw, uh, the Union general. What he would do is he'd flank Johnson on, mm-hmm. on the right, forcing him to fall back closer to Atlanta to defend the city. And this repeated this repeated itself over and over again to the point that caused significant frustration within the Confederate government and some of Johnson's generals. I mean, just think about it. Sherman has drove Johnston 100 miles towards Atlanta, and by July, he's going to be on the outskirts of the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he's got his three armies with him, which he has the Army of the Cumberland which is commanded by General George Henry Thomas. It's the largest of his three armies. Um, he has 60,000 men. Uh, Sherman is also going to have the Army of the Tennessee, which is commanded by General James, James Burbsey McPherson. He has 30,000 men. And the smallest of these armies is going to be the Army of the Ohio, commanded by General Schofield. So he's got this gigantic, as you said, it's a land shark that is slowly making its way to Atlanta and, yeah. you know, they've had battles like Rosaka, Pickett's Mill, Kennesaw, and all that so far. Yeah, yeah. and the Confederates, and, and, and really preparation of Sherman's advance to the city, the Confederates built a series of defenses at the Chattahoochee River, that real last line of defense for Atlanta. Now, these defenses were significant, and it was called basically the Chattahoochee Line. It was also mm-hmm. called the Johnston Line. and was really the Civil War equivalent of the French Maginot Line. In World War II, it really mm-hmm. was. It was a series of earthworks designed by a guy named Francis A. Shoup, Mary. It was about 10 miles long, surrounding the perimeter of the city. It had five unique redoubts uh, that were named after the after the designer, and they were called Shoupadates. And, and it was really, they had 16-foot walls. They were all designed to keep Sherman out. And this line had ni- a 19-gun positions with 77 artillery pieces, abatis in front to prevent from climbing the walls the rebs also cut down thousands of, of trees in front to create a clear line of fire for the artillery and so this was kind of their last gasp if you think about it but the huge problem though was that the line really had its back to the chattahoochee river so johnston he was so confident that really that he could hold this line that he told jefferson davis mary was the president of the confederacy mm-hmm. I don't know if you know that not but the guy with the hat he was not. He told Jay Davis that he could hold this line for up to a month and that as his much smaller army, which we'll talk about, was going to be able to hold back Sherman's larger one. But it's fascinating, though, that if he really believed that, Johnson had his headquarters where? On the other side of the river yeah. just to be safe. So it's just fascinating that he gave himself that position. But, but unfortunately for Johnston, that line he felt he could defend for a month it lasted about a week because Sherman yep. is going to pull that rope a dope uh, on, on Johnson yet again and to get around Johnson's flank. Yeah. And he's so Johnston is eventually going to abandon what you said was the Chattahoochee line. And this is going to be kind of one of the kind of the final nail in the coffin for Johnston leading the army. Yep. Of Tennessee. But it's, gr- it's great how he does it, though, because he always went around to the right. Right. That's how he finds him. Right. But at this point, you know what Sherman does? He sends John Schofield and that army of the Ohio you mentioned around the rebel right, the Union left, where they cross the Chattahoochee to outflank the rebel position, making that Johnson line completely untenable. So once again, what does Johnson do? He's forced to fall back and move to a high ground about a mile south to a stream called Peachtree Creek, which is a tributary to the main Chattahoochee River. And the good thing about this for Johnson is the spring and summer rains had flooded the area. So Johnson mm-hmm. hoped that this flooded Peachtree Creek in this Chattahoochee tributary would really create a really difficult pass for, for Sherman to get through for any Union invaders and would actually de- deter Sherman from attacking Atlanta directly. Yeah, well, that's as we're going to see, that's not going to be the case. And Sherman is going to end up crossing the Chattahoochee as well, which this is, I've seen it compared to when Caesar crosses the Rubicon. So once Caesar crosses the Rubicon, you can't go back. 
when Sherman crosses the Chattahoochee, that is seen as he can't go back. It means he cannot go back north. And he is now committed to getting Atlanta and capturing the city. If he goes back across, that's going to have severe consequences for the north. And they don't need the morale broken. Like he, that was a, you know, big thing on his part. Now, mind you, Johnston doesn't really do anything to stop him from crossing the Chattahoochee, which I think was another thing that kind of is making Jeff Davis like, what, what is, what is Johnston's plan with this? And when they crossed the river, uh, Johnston wrote, uh, wrote a letter to a member of General Hood's staff of all people. And it said, our presence on the south side of the Chattahoochee created considerable alarm and the good people of that city have been getting to the rear in a hurry. So I think the people of Atlanta are thinking like, what, like, is Sherman going to be here at any point? Um, and the well, other thing, well, that's, that's, that's like, the whole thing. Yeah. Right? Like, and that's what they're, you know, think gone with the wind and the panic in that movie, right. but that was more around the battle of like the kind of the siege of Atlanta. So it's creating increased panic among the citizens of Atlanta and it's causing rumors to flow amongst the soldiers now that is Johnson really going to fight for the city or is he just going to abandon it to General Sherman and his gigantic army? Um, and Johnson did give indications that he was going to hold the city as long as possible. But again, like, you know, Davis and also Bragg, Dave, General Bragg, Davis's military advisor, who's going to come into play here in a few minutes, they are really starting to question what exactly General Joseph E. Johnson's intentions are with the city of Atlanta and what he plans to do with Sherman. Well, that's that's the whole thing. We talk about the big picture, right? Elections coming up. Johnson goes to Atlanta, holds out as long as he can, runs the clock out to the election. Mm -hmm. And and that's probably the big picture. But what is it? What short picture? You've got 22,000 loyal Confederate citizens in Atlanta. You've got a major supply and, and manufacturing hub. You've already lost Chattanooga. You've already lost a lot of the ports. You cannot lose Atlanta. And this, this game plan is causing a pucker effect in Richmond and is causing a lot of people upset. Now, Joseph E. Johnson and Jefferson Davis were not exactly besties. They were not even close. They didn't really, oh, they weren't at all. And, no. and basically, the, and, and the commanding general, he complained regularly about the fact that he didn't have enough men to fight Sherman, especially mm -hmm. for an offensive attack. And that's a big theme with this. We see it a lot with another guy on the northern side. General McClellan. Right. Yep. And it's the same thing. He's always asking for more men. Now, Johnson comes up with a plan to use rebel cavalry to disrupt Sherman's rail line in northern Georgia that was supplying supplies to the Federals. But since he couldn't spare any of his own men, what does he do? He reaches out to Davis to pull cavalry from Alabama to try to do it for him. Now, Davis did not buy the Army of Tennessee's numbers that were, that were much smaller than Sherman, so he rejected the request. Basically telling Johnston, look, you got plenty of cavalry in this army to conduct the raid using your own mm -hmm. men. Dare I say, Mary, Davis was overestimating the size of his Johnston. There we go. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. But, but, Bad but, but, joke but, for the episode. I know, whatever, anyway. <laughs> but so again, Johnston paused basically so he because he could not spare any cavalry. And this pissed off Davis immensely. And the raid on Sherman's supply line was never made. Now, it was around this time when some of Johnston's subordinates were getting fed up with his, their commander as well. Mm -hmm. It started sending messages directly to Davis behind Johnston's back complaining about him. Specifically, two people, Mary, yes. William Hardy and John Bell Hood. Now, they both wrote, wrote to the Army of Tennessee and, and current uh, Davis advisor – Braxton Bragg, Mary, complaining that Johnson had missed several opportunities to attack Sherman during this campaign and just didn't do it. In a very self-promoting letter to Braxton Bragg, John Bell Hood wrote, and I quote, Mary, <laughs> I have, General, so often urged that we should force the enemy to give us battle as to almost be regarded reckless by the officers high in rank in this army. Since my views have been so directly the opposite. I regard it as a great misfortune that we have failed to give battle to the enemy so many miles north of our present position. Please say to the president that I shall continue to do my duty cheerfully and faithfully. John Bell Hood, XOXO. 
That's the letter he that he writes to him. Now, also, Cavalry Commander Joseph Warchild Wheeler Mary, he suggested that the that the plan that Johnson suggested of attacking Sherman's supply line. Guess what? It was his idea, and mm. when he presented it to Johnston, Johnston said, "No, we ain't doing that." And so. This is all going on, not just but the military, but the politicians. Georgia Senator Benjamin Hill, he visited Davis in Richmond, and when he returned, he, he said Johnston, and he did, Hill did an urgent message saying, for God's sakes, do it, meaning attack. Johnston ignores the message, just ignores it. Yeah. Georgia Governor Joseph E. Brown, who will later be part of that corrupt Georgia bourbon triumvirate with, with John Brown Gordon and Alfred Colquitt. He begged Johnson to attack and save the city from Sherman. But again, guess what? He ignores it. Mm -hmm. So, again, this is really when Davis is going to start to give serious thought about maybe replacing Johnson as Sherman drew closer. But little did Sherman know that while he was moving his plate, his chess pieces into place to attack, his mere presence was causing a political crisis in, in Richmond. Yeah. But the thing is, is, Davis did not want to fire Johnson at this point because he had no idea who to replace him with. It's great when you want to get rid of somebody. It's like it's like you're firing your football coach. Get rid of him. But you have no one to bring him back. What are you going to do? So what does he do? He dispatches Bragg to go to Atlanta, who's going to arrive on July 13th, and he's going to meet with Joseph E. Johnson and his high-ranking subordinates. Yeah. Now, soon later, Braxy is going to message Davis – ripping on Johnston, basically saying, look, he, I have no idea what he's planning to do with Atlanta. I don't think he knows what he wants to do. Yeah. And I Hood, think, when Bragg went there, it was very shady. Like he didn't disclose exactly why right. he was there. This is all behind back stuff. Yeah. But he basically, Braxton says, I think what you should do is you should fire Johnston and you should bring in John Bell Hood. And he says, and this is a quote from Bragg, he says, they, that he was the best they had, all considering the considerate, all considering the situation, was a shot at Hardy. Is what that was going yeah. back to the, the, the previous stuff, right? Yeah. But Davis was still not convinced, and he was afraid that dumping Johnston would cause problems with the men who loved him, and because Johnston didn't recklessly attack, he didn't put these people in a situation where he was going to risk their lives, and the men loved him. Morale was already low in the Army of Tennessee, mm -hmm. so firing the popular Joseph E. Johnston would probably bottom them out if you think about it. Yeah. Also, replacing Johnston would screw up the command structure of the Army right when Sherman is on the doorstep. Yeah, it's not a good time to change. And I mean, even Davis is writing to Robert E. Lee. There was a letter that he said General Johnston has failed and there are strong indications he will abandon Atlanta. Um he also writes in this letter, he urges that prisoners should be immediately removed from Andersonville. So who knows what Johnson is thinking at that point. Um, but then Davis also says, it seems necessary to remove him at once. And then he says, who should, who should succeed him, comma, what think you of Hood for the position? So at that point, you know, he is, he is considering Hood. And then as you said, Hood um, also writes a letter where he's openly criticizing Johnston. Um, but the thing is, some of that criticism that you know hood is saying he was the one that sometimes told johnson no i don't think we should attack there was one well, incident where it happened and johnston said he regretted it afterwards he was like i don't know why i listened to them well that that's the whole thing and for the next three days after 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 davis gets this message she's going to kind of to waffle decide what he wants to do in his yeah. mind and he's gonna and he's gonna message johnson he's gonna basically say okay dude listen um what exactly is your plan? Just tell me what it is. So this is on July 16, 1864. Yeah. Davis got Johnston's message explaining how, what his intention was to defend the city of Atlanta. And this note, again, um, said, once again, I need more men. And he, he I, I don't have that many. And so he, therefore, I'm left with no other possible solution than to continue my defensive position around Atlanta. Now, when Davis got this message, he yelled fudge, but he yeah, didn't say fudge. Like fudge. Okay. He realized that Johnson was going to sacrifice Atlanta. That's what you said a little while ago. That vital supply hub in all those citizens. He was going to just let him get siege and let him get beaten down to run the clock out. Now, the next day on July 17th, Davis 
is basically had enough. He's like, you know what? I I, I wanted a plan. You sent me the same crap again. I'm going to need to get rid of him. So he does. July 17th, he's going to fire Joseph E. Johnson from command. He's going to take Bragg's advice, and he's going to install the uber-aggressive John Bell Hood mm-hmm. and, and made him a temporary full general. Now, we've talked a lot about Hood in previous episodes, and we'll eventually do a full full deal. But yeah. real, real quick, his background, because people know who he is, but you know, he's born in June of 1831 in Owingsville, Kentucky. He's not a Texan, Mary. He's a Kentuckian. Mm-hmm. But let's get to that. The son of John, Dr. John Willis Hood and Theodosia French Hood, the cousin of U.S. Representative uh, Richard French Mary, who was against his father's wishes, arranged for John to get an appointment to West Point. And that's how he got there. At West Point, John Bell Hood, who was known as Sam to his peers, was, was kind of like you in high school. Not a good student. I was a good student. I was just a nerd and got shoved into lockers a lot. Uh, That's probably true. But Hood, he graduated 44th out of 52 in a class that included future combatants John Burbs McPherson, Mm -hmm. John Schofield, Phil Sheridan, as well as future Confederate, the gallant John Bowen, Mary. He was in that class as well. The gallant John Bowen. But the thing about it, though, Hood did almost didn't graduate. He was a demerit machine. He got 196 <laughs> demerits. 200, you were gone. He got 196 for such infractions such as disobedience and an overall bad appearance. Okay. Oh my God, the poor guy. I mean, his de- well, he, his decisions were usually wrong and not really right. Right there, you go. Right now. The superintendent of cadets at West Point at that time, Mary, was a guy named Robert E. Lee. Mm-hmm. And he took a shine to Hood and basically made him lieutenant of cadets. Ironically, he was tasked with enforcing discipline. Okay. So but Lee quickly learned that he made a huge mistake. And within two months, Hood got in trouble again for, quote, absent without authority, whatever the heck that means. Where do you and- go? You're on a military base. But, but in 1860, Hood is offered a position at West Point as chief instructor of cavalry, but he turned it down because 1860, there's rumblings of war coming. He doesn't. He wants to position himself in the South is what he wants to do. And between graduating and then, he found himself in the second lieutenant in the fourth U.S. cavalry, a second U.S. infantry rather in California, and then sent to the second U.S. cavalry in Texas, where he served under Albert City Johnson. And Robert E. Lee. 1857, he's fighting the Comanches. He's famously shot in the hand by the arrow, that whole story. But after the firing of Fort Sumter, Hood resigned his commission and he moved to where? To Texas. Why? Because Kentucky was neutral. He yep. wanted to fight for the Confederacy. That's how he gets to Texas. Wow. He's, he's going to rise quickly. He'll serve in the cavalry on the peninsula on our old friend John Magruder, Mary. And then on September 30th, 1861, he's made the colonel of the 4th Texas. Now, a few months later, in February of 1862, he gets, he gets command of the, what's called the Texas Brigade. Mm-hmm. This is the famous 1st, the 4th, the 5th Texas, as well as the 18th Georgia. Yeah, there were Georgians there, Mary. Commanded oh. by, William, by William Wofford, of all people. Hood is going to quickly earn the reputation of being a very aggressive commander while serving on the peninsula under W.H.C. Whiting's division. So he's the type, again, he's going to personally lead his men from the front his Texas Brigade is going to become one of the elite brigades of the entire Confederate Army. You know, we talked a lot about Hood at Gaines Mill on June 27th of 1862 yeah. when he led that charge and broke the Union line a month later when General Whiting gets sick and goes on medical leave. Hood becomes a division commander under James Longstreet. So his star is on the rise. His Hood's division fought relentlessly at 2nd Manassas. He lost 1,000 men. He also and he also got arrested by his boss, Nathan Shanks Evans, something about a captured ambulance train. Who the hell knows? What? But he got arrested. He got arrested by Shanks for it. But General Lee is going to basically rescue him from that arrest. He's going to basically continue to lead that his men. He's going to lead his men at South Mountain and Tedham, where he's going to lose 2,000 more men. Mm-hmm. And he's going to earn the title of Major General on October 10th of 1862. Famously, he's going to fight at the Gettysburg at the Bushman Farm. He's going to be wounded on July 2nd on that echelon attack, and he's going to be sent to Richmond to, to recover. Now, it's on this re- this rehab mission to, to uh, Richmond where he's going to become close friends with Jefferson Davis. Yeah. This is where he's going to get to know him. And Davis said of Hood, 
he had a fierce light in his eyes that I can never forget. Okay. Yeah. But that's what it was. So what is Hood? He's because he's a super aggressive guy. He fights. He puts his men in tough positions, but he's up front with them. Eventually, he's going to get sent west as part of Longstreet's Corps. He'll be wounded again at Chickamauga. He'll find himself a new home in the Army of Tennessee. And before too long, at just 33 years old, he finds himself promoted now by Davis to be the commander of the Army of Tennessee. Yeah. And the thing about it, though, is Davis, you know, he may have been happy to finally get his aggressive battle commander. Now, again, you mentioned before, Joseph e. Johnson, passive, falling back, falls back for 100 yep. miles back to the, the dorsum of Atlanta, doesn't want to fight. He wants to, he wants to redeploy, fight defenses, redeploy. But not everybody in the Confederacy was happy about this move, including no. Robert E. Lee, Mary, of all people. Yeah. Uh, he now – Hood was someone who was trained under Stonewall Jackson and Robert yeah. Lee. And this is this is where he and again he's young. But a lot of these people in the South were not happy about this. They called Hood a butcher, a lot of the soldiers, because of his previous battles and his reputation of maybe being too aggressive. Many of his officers doubted Hood's abilities mm -hmm. above the division level. Now, we mentioned that before. Robert E. Lee said it specifically of Hood when he got promoted to this position by Davis. Lee quoted, he said, Hood is a bold fighter, but I am doubtful to the other qualities necessary. Now, again, Lee wanted William Hardy to take command. Yeah. But again, Hardy was offered the position. He noped it. So Davis was not going back to that well to ask Hardy. I, I don't blame him for that, you know, um, and we've talked about this many times, but if you know the history of Army of Tennessee, it has been, especially since the death of Albert Sidney Johnson at the Battle of Shiloh, it's, it's been a mess. But it was a mess, I think, even, I shouldn't say a mess. It was just very much like, I don't know if I want to say mismanaged, but it is like, I mean, we've always said the, the Western theater, and this is this is something good. It's like the, the land of misfit toys. It, it's such an interesting study for that reason, because you were getting not just the military stuff, but there's a lot of drama and there's definitely a lot of drama in the, in the army of Tennessee. And so shot pouch Walker, um, he writes his wife um, after the change in, in command. And he said of Hardy, he said, Hardy's star has always been in the ascendant and he always the most dashing light around the throne. I wonder how he likes to have it obscured and suffer an eclipse by the passing of this new planet between him and the sun. And that like, that just says it all right there, how Hardy felt, you know, Hardy says no, but then he's not happy. No, about of course this not. Change in command. But I mean, you know, Hardy is not like, I'm not taking, taking on this role. And yes, Hardy was one of the, biggest guy you know he was one of the louder voices to go against Braxton Bragg he was one of the ones that signed that petition yeah. um would he have been a good commander I think he probably would have I mean I like Hardy you know he's a pretty competent guy but you know in the soldiers in Army of Tennessee they like Johnston even though he's not really they don't know what he's doing now that they've fallen back towards Atlanta but they like him and I think it's kind of like he's you know kind of I think he's the same around the same age as Robert E. Lee. So there's that kind of that father figure going on, I think, too. And now you've got this, what is who had 33 years old right. in charge of the army. And I think that's a change that no one was expecting. Um, and meanwhile, over on the union side, you have the you have thoughts that they that the union troops have. Um, you know, General Howard said of John that Johnson was cautious, wary, flexible full of expedience, whereas Hood was incautious, blunt, strong-willed, and fearless of Sherman's strategy. He was not the general to execute any plan but his own, and then he ought not to have had a Sherman or a Thomas for an opponent. In a letter to his wife, um, now this is after the Battle of Peachtree Creek, Sherman or Howard will write, Hood is a stupid fellow, but a hard fighter, does very unexpected things. And yeah, that's the most that, insulting thing I've ever found that Howard has written. Well, I mean, it, it was – you mentioned before, I mean, going back to the Confederacy again, not just lot, not just the senior guys, but Arthur Manigault. You know, he's a brigade commander in, in S.D. Lee's Corps. He said of Hood's promotion, again, the Army received the announcement with very bad grace and no little murmuring. 
Fun fact about Manigal, by the way, his, his uncle, Arthur Middleton Mayor, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence and probably knew about the map on the back. Right? There you go. Okay. But the thing about it, though, you saw a lot of the Confederates not liking it. A lot of the Union guys liked it. When Sherman heard of the news, he could not, he couldn't believe it. He writes to his wife, Ellen, he says, at this critical moment, the Confederate government rendered us the most valuable of services. I confess I was pleased with the change. Why was he pleased? Because she was thrilled at the prospect of the aggressive Hood attacking his entrenched army now when he knew that Hood had probably half the numbers that he did. George Thomas, shockingly, was the only guy in the Union who was more cautious. He said of Hood, Hood will hit you before you know it. That's what he said. He he was kind of like the, well, I don't know, Davey. He's like, Eeyore. That's what he was. He's right. Eeyore. Like, but I mean, yeah. even, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so this is kind of the setup with it. So it's when Sherman is going to be, Nick, you said a while ago, when Sherman is going to cross the Chattahoochee, he's going to move his men southeast in an arc towards Decatur, Georgia, which is about eight miles east of Atlanta to cut the railroad in and out of the city, right? So going back to July 17th again, George Thomas and his army of the Cumberland, the biggest one, they're on the northern bank of the Chattahoochee River while James Burbsey McPherson's army of the Tennessee and his 20,000 men were about 12 miles away. Joseph Schofield's army of the Ohio was on the eastern shore of the, of the river between Thomas and McPherson. Now, again, the next day on the 18th, Thomas is going to reach Peachtree Creek which was only defended by a small cavalry force for the most part and some infantry on the south bank. And he kind of drove them off pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But but McPherson and Schofield, you know, they soon arrived just north later on. Um, while east of Atlanta, cavalry under a guy named Colonel Kennard Garrard, his division is going to be cutting the railroad. Uh, the Georgia Railroad. Now, Sherman, again, what is he doing? He's slowly choking Atlanta with the goal of separating it from the rest mm -hmm. of the Confederacy. And once he cuts the tracks leading from Atlanta to Montgomery, Alabama, he's going to be ready. He has them isolated. And again, Sherman, he's going to write to George Thomas on, the, on July 19th, the day before the battle we're going to talk about. He writes, with McPherson, Howard, and Schofield, I should have ample to fight the whole of Hood's army, leaving you to walk into Atlanta capturing guns and everything he's a confident fellow mary at he's, this point he's very confident but that goes back to you know when when hood gets placed in charge um sherman does go to john schofield his classmate at west point and asks him about it and their conversation basically sherman comes away from it and he says in his memoirs i just inferred from that 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 means we're finally gonna fight and i think you know as you said that makes sherman feel better it means they're going to stop this. Cause I think he like, like Johnson, just whatever he was doing, he was able to keep falling back and keep in mind that although they're, you know, a lot of the battles on the Atlanta campaign so far have been, they're smaller scale compared to what you're seeing in the Eastern theater with the Gettysburgs and all that. And they're not as big as the battles for Chattanooga or Chicken Chickamauga, but very slowly the both armies are losing men and that's well, like that's very draining on them they are they've, they've reached that stagnant point but now yeah. the army of, of tennessee is, is a little different now and with under with hood now they got about thirty five thousand infantry about ten thousand cavalry 1500 militia mm -hmm. um clowns maybe we don't know but they're in a defensive position one mile south of peach tree creek and they're going to set up in a line with alexander p stewart's corps on the rebel left William Hardy's corps basically in the middle, and ben Benjamin Cheatham, who's now been promoted to replace Hood, is going to be on the rebel right. He's also got Joseph Wheeler's cavalry kind of guarding the eastern roads into Atlanta. And perhaps remembering his, well, his old days under Lee, who fought under with less men, Hood decided the best defense is an offense. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you got to remember, too, he kind of cut his teeth under Lee. Lee was never concerned about numbers. Look at you. you look at Chancellorsville. Yeah. You look at Gettysburg. You look at a Fredericksburg. Pick them all. So what is Hood like? He's like, I, if if I fight a good strategy and I fight aggressively and I have the terrain, the high grounds, and I, I I if I'm smart, 
I can beat this much larger army because that's what Lee taught him. But he's not Lee, and that's what gets him. No, and that's what's good, right? No, and and Hood also is going into this role. He is not happy about it, um, and that's one thing that definitely needs to be mentioned is that there are stories that he did try to persuade Davis to change his mind. And he did say on taking upon taking command, I feel the weight of responsibility so suddenly and unexpectedly devolved upon me. So there, you know, there are people that there, you know, that say Hood was seeking command. This is what he did deliberately. But there's also the other side of it that he wasn't. And that letter he wrote was just to try and get Johnson replaced, but not replaced with him. Um, and then so it's debated if Hood did did get that command deliberately. Um, the other thing, too, that he's going into this battle of Peachtree Creek is that he actually thought Joseph E. Johnston was going to stick around for a little bit. And guess what? Johnston completely ghosts him. He says to him a couple days before, yeah, I'm just going to go to Atlanta for a few days and, and I'll come back and I'll kind of help you with the transition to power. That doesn't happen. And Hood is bitter about it for the rest of his life. Um, he well, is left basically yeah. abandoned and he's, um, you know, this, this plan, this battle of Peachtree Creek, as I'm sure we'll talk about is it, it has been, some have credited it with being Joseph E. Johnston's plan. Well, it was Joseph E. Johnston's plan. Yeah. It was, it, 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 yeah. it, it completely yeah. was his plan. Yeah. It, it certainly was. Now the thing about it though, is, you know, but he, he was going to pull the trigger. Who the hell knows? I mean, Hood's target at this point because he 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 has, he has he knows he has Thomas's army of the Cumberland kind of split up a little bit. Yeah. That's going to be the target because he knows that Thomas is going to be crossing that swollen Peachtree Creek north of Atlanta, and they'd be vulnerable while they were crossing. So he knew he knew that Hood did that while they were crossing. Thomas had little chance to defend themselves if mm -hmm. he timed it. If the timing was right. He could pull it off just right. That was his plan. So late on July 19th, Hood's going to call a meeting with his subordinates, a council of war, right? Ooh. That's what he's going to call to go over this plan of attack. But he demanded them. Hood said, this attack has to start no later than 1 p.m. tomorrow. Has to. No later. Okay? She never put a time on things in the Civil well, War. Exactly. Because it but never his, happens. And so what does he do? He dusts off the old playbook from Gettysburg with James Longstreet and decides, hey, I'm going to do an echelon attack. It almost worked at Gettysburg in a much bigger situation. It was mismanaged and it didn't work because of different – because timing. If I get my guys to attack when I say and we hit them just right like Longstreet could have – I'm, my echelon attack is going to break this line. So you can see where he gets it from, but that's what he's going to do. So his he's going to attack an echelon from right to left with using seven divisions, four under William Hardy and three under Alex Stewart. He's going to put them 200 yards apart from each other, and they would attack Thomas's four Union divisions at Peachtree Creek. Solid plan overall. Eventually, mm -hmm. the, 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 this weight of this attack would break the line of the Union. The Rebs would breach the gap and crush the Union line. Everyone goes home, gets ice cream. That was the plan, right, for the most part. Hood is going to tell Stuart and Hardy, you take everything south of Peachtree Creek and you hold it at all hazards. You stay right there. Now, we'll go through the breakdown of how this whole thing goes, but William Bates' division, which is part of Hardy's corps in the far mm -hmm. right, they're going to be chosen to lead the attack, followed by Shot Pouch Walker. We yep. talked about him. And then George Maney's division is going to follow. Dominoes fall. Bang, bang, bang. Yep. Pat Patrick Claiborne's hard-fighting division is going to be in reserve, and they're going to stay in the back. And as soon as that break happens, Claiborne's going in. And that's when they're going to attack. Clay they're going to hit them with your strongest division when their pants are down. He's going to Kool-Aid man it. He's going to Kool-Aid man right through. He's going to he's going to hit that with a shillelagh. He's going to get right through. <laughs> Fun fact, though, he he doesn't have Thomas Hinman here. Hinman's lost because he ran into his branch with knocked his eye out on a horse. And he's he's on medical of all, of all things. Right. Oh but so really. And then continuing down that line, once you finish with the Hardee's Corps, you've got Stewart's three division. Yeah. First under William Loring. 
and then Edward Walthall, and finally Samuel French. And they're going to continue that assault on Thomas, hoping to break the line, force them back to the Chattahoochee, where their backs can be towards the river, where they're going to be trapped, and they're going to get them, right? The final piece of Hood's plan was to put Benjamin Cheatham's corps and Joseph Wheeler's cavalry on the far right of Hardy to get between Thomas and the armies of, of Schofield and McPherson mm -hmm. to block them from coming to assist. Because they're out east. They're east of Atlanta. They're north and east. If he puts, you know, he's going to put Cheatham and he's going to put, he's going to put well, Wheeler there. So he's going to separate this army of the Cumberland right in the crosshairs. They can, no, no one's going to come help them, push them. Their backs going to be against the Chattahoochee River. Even with only 30 something thousand guys, we're going to beat them. That's the whole plan. Hood wanted to beat Thomas in detail while they were separated from the rest of Sherman's army. And he hoped that a quick, time specific coordinated attack would demolish them before the others could arrive but there's a problem mary there's always a problem yeah right the problem is this while hood is making his plans to attack on the 20th you know who else is making plans sherman 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 is making plans and he's he's ma he's making plans to be contrary to what hood wants sherman is going to order a portion of his army to start the march to atlanta from Decatur, like we said, east of the city, yep. which is just eight, eight miles away at five o'clock in the morning, which is about six hours, or I guess it would be like 10 hours before Hood's planned attack on that same day, using Black Jack Logan's 15 uh, Corps from McPherson's Army of the Tennessee. Now, again, within just a few hours of, of five o'clock in the morning, we're on the 20th now, Logan's already three miles from the city. Yeah, and he's starting so to close. And he started to shell the city. There's a story where some a small child is killed across the street with her parents oh from artillery fire. It, it, it's, a, it's an ugly, Atlanta is ugly, right? But Hood realizes, he's like, oh, crap. He realizes now, I'm planning to attack north of Atlanta. I have an existential threat coming from the east now. <laughs> and, and, and a serious threat to the city coming from Cheatham, who is already east of Hardy. Yeah. So... He's going to, so Hood is going to take advice of the Spice Girls here and shimmy to the right. It is what he's going to do and move everybody. If you're having a good over. time. Exactly. That's what he's going to do. <laughs> now, he's going to order Cheatham to move to the east to protect the city from Blackjack coming. So that's going to separate Cheatham from the rest of the, the Confederate army that he wants to attack. So he's specific to Cheatham. Here's where you need to go. And guess what Cheatham does? He screws it up. Yeah, he does. There's so it's much miscommunication. And, and again, you always say, um, you know, there's three things that will get you miscommunication, terrain, and weather. In this case, with the Battle of Peachtree Creek, it is miscommunication that is mm -hmm. definitely screwing things up for the Confederates here. It does. So, what does Cheatham do? He goes two miles too far to the east and it creates a gigantic gap. So now Cheatham's not going to be able to hold Schofield away and McPherson away. He puts himself, he takes himself off the dance floor. So now that that reserves, that protection to hold them is the, he's going to hold the nose. And he, but he, now he can't do it anymore. So they're gone. The other problem is Cheatham is going to take a full two hours to get into position. So Stuart and Hardy are sitting in the woods on Rose Clown Alert, looking in the woods, okay? <laughs> and they're waiting to begin the attack. Now, again, this attack was supposed to start at 1 p.m. specific, yep. okay? And right off the bat, the timing's out the window, thanks to Logan's move to the city from Decatur. And that's how you get lucky if you're Sherman, how you get unlucky if you're, if you're a hood. Yeah. So, so this time frame is important because guess what happens while they're waiting? Thomas is now able to move his men across Peachtree Creek unmolested, yeah. and soon the Union troops are able to set up defensive earthworks on high ground just a half a mile south of the creek. Remember, the plan was to hit them while they were crossing. Now they're across. The, the, the horse is oh. out of the barn now. Yeah, they, they, now, get a, they get across. So instead of hitting Thomas while he's holding his diaper in the rain and unprepared, now he's going to have to hit Thomas's army, the Cumberland, on high ground in defensive positions. Oh, crap. That's what's going to happen. So now it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and Hardy has to realign as well. 
He's in position to attack, so he sends word to Alexander Stewart and says, basically, who's on his left, he says, um, I'm almost ready, so you know, get ready. That's kind of what he's saying. Hardy is going to give a big speech. He's going to tell the rest of he's going to tell his men, men, the fate of Atlanta and the outcome of the battle rests on us. This big, this big emotional speech that Hardy does, right? And so an hour or so later, so we're getting close to three o'clock in the afternoon now, it's supposed to start at one o'clock. William Bates' lead division we talked about, they're going to begin to move out. And guess what happens when they start to move out? There's no they place. get lost. Yeah. They go the wrong frigging way. Inexplicably, when they get started, they end up on the wrong side of a creek called Clear Creek and proceeded to go into a swampy area and got lost for a that couple sucks. of hours. There was probably snakes. But oh, geez. But again, a lot a lot of it's because that huge gap that they're going, but they're going too far to the right. And yeah. instead of going, instead of going one o'clock high, they're going 230 high. And now they're veering off to the right. They're going into a swamp going away from the action. And again, they're supposed to be the initial attack. The echelon attack depends on Bate's division starting the dance and the rest of the army's waiting for Bate. And he's lost now. So Bate was quite surprised, Mary, when he started marching and he couldn't find any Union troops, shockingly. And he's going to march right into that large gap between Thomas's army of the Cumberland in Schofield's Army of the Ohio, far off to the east, and they're going to be stumbling around looking for Union troops to fight. That's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And again, this is supposed to be the echelon attack. So Stewart's divisions, Loring, Walthall, and French, are going to have to wait until Hardy's gone in. So they're just sitting around again. So this is this is July 2nd, 1863, Gettysburg, all over again. They're yeah. waiting, right? So Shot Pouch Walker's men, they start to move in anyway. They're the next line to go in after bait. Even though they didn't hear any fighting on their right from bait, they're going to start to move in. And they're going to be the first division that, that's going to find action. They're going to hit Union. They're going to hit a Union division under Joe, uh, John Newton's division in the 4th Corps, commanded by guess who? New Oliver Otis Howard. Otis Howard. Okay, Howard is going to be the, the Corps commander. Now, Newton's guys, his divisions, they're already entrenched now because they're waiting. So Shot Pouch's men are going to run into them. Bait now, hears rumblings from on his left of fire, can of fire. And he starts to march towards the sound of the guns. And he's going to finally find Newton's right flank where he was supposed to be. Yeah. Under a, and a brigade of Georgians under Clement Stevens is going to capture a portion of the Union earthworks on the right-hand side. But again, they're going to hold these earthworks for a little while, but they're going to get pushed back until they, Clement Stevens gets mortally wounded. But yeah, and Howard does say like Howard's um, description of the Battle of Peachtree Creek is really worth reading. Now it's just from his perspective and what his guys were doing. Um, but he says of Newton that Newton could never be surprised. And when they were crossing, like they had to build bridges and stuff. And like Newton apparently got his done in like record time or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like Newton is a guy like Howard was really impressed with him. Um, Geary is there too. Howard's really impressed with him. Like Howard is just like kind of like he's I don't want to say he's along for the ride because he's in charge here. Um of he's this, kind of he's kind of, of along of, for the ride. Yeah, he is actually. Man. Yeah, no, I'm gonna say, yeah, he's just like, oh, wow, these guys are really good, kind of thing. <laughs> um, but you know, he's got Wood, Newton, and Stanley with him, and they're all having to cross, and they all have to, like, a lot of them have to build bridges and stuff. But the other thing that Howard does talk a lot about is just the terrain that they are up against, that it is like steep, it's crazy, it, it's not fun. It's It's basically the Western theater, which is and I think he's writing about it to contrast it with what he experienced in the Eastern theater, but he's very descriptive about the terrain that they are encountering at this battle. Yeah. And the, speaking of terrain, Bates men, there's the rest of the division. They're stumbling around the left of Newton's main line, and they are going to run the third brigade under the command of Luther Bradley and his Illinois men. Now Bradley is able to drive them back. Bate is going to have repeated attacks on Bradley but battery uh, on Illinois under Wilfred, uh, Wilbur Godspeed, 
is battery A from the first Ohio and battery M of the first uh, Illinois. You're going to help drive Bate back. So Bate's going to be kind of on an island fighting on his own. And he's going to be to the right of the – instead of hitting them straight up, he's hitting them from – he's hitting them on their right flank. So he's going to fight them, but it's not going to do anything for this echelon. He just he's – fight, he's fighting on an island. The woods, speaking of terrain, really prevented Bate from attacking with his full division. So he had his Kentucky Brigade and a Joseph Lewis Brigade of Georgians and Tennesseans um, under Thomas Smith, as well as Jesse Finley's Florida Brigade. They're going to attack piecemeal because they can't attack full because they're, they're in the woods. They're in the wrong position. They ended up firing back and forth for the rest of the day. But for the most part, Bates' division took themselves out of his battle and was ineffective really from right at the beginning. So Bates is pretty much has pretty much taken himself off the dance floor. Next in line is George Maney's division. Now, Maney, the last one in Hardy's Corps that he had to, he was the last one. So he had, he had to wait until shot pouch Walker's division on his right to move. Yeah. And he, but he didn't wait and he moves forward when they saw the first brigade, again, of John Newton's division commanded by um, our old friend, Nathan Kimball, Mary Ball people who was all by themselves and separated from the rest of Newton's division. Now, once they encountered Kimball, Maney's men, for some reason, stopped pursuing and fell on their stomachs and spent the rest of the, They stopped marching. They took to the ground, as the phrase is. Given Kimball's history, I don't blame them. I mean, this is the man to beat uh, yeah. Stonewall Jackson and General Lee, right? Well, I mean, they're supposed to march forward and attack. They start marching forward, and they stop, and they drop, and they stop, drop, and roll. But they don't move <laughs> forward. So, again, this is another division that's supposed to attack. It's supposed to have seven divisions. You really two of them, one of them took themselves out of position. One isn't going. One stays. So right off the bat, they drop on Kimball's right, which is the end of Newton's division, would be the division of a guy named William T. Ward from Joseph Hooker's 20th Corps. Now they weren't there at the beginning. Ward's division was the last to arrive at Peachtree Creek and had to move up quickly. And this is kind of a fascinating story with, with Ward, okay? They heard from pickets from the Rebs who were trying that that the Rebs are trying to exploit a gap that emerged between the divisions of John Geary and Newton's division because Ward wasn't there yet. They were supposed to be in that position, so there's a gap between the two. And they're going to basically supposed to be in a place called Collier Road. That's where they're supposed to go. Now, one of William Loring's brigades, who's next in that echelon attack, six regiments of Mississippians under a guy named Winfield and Featherston. They come really close to punching through that gap through Ward's division right then. But Ward's going to arrive at this gap in the nick of time. Three Union brigades under Ward, commanded by future U.S. President Benjamin Harrison, Mary, mm -hmm. John Coburn and James Wood, are going to rush their brigade south as Featherston rushes north. Now, it's cool when you think about this a little bit, because usually in Civil War battles, you've got one army who's playing defense. They're entrenched. They're waiting behind a wall. And you have the other ones who are coming to attack them. This is different. This is like the beginning of a football game. You have two armies rushing forward at each other. And they hit themselves straight on to the place called Redland Road. And they fight where they hit. So no one's set in position. They, they, they're going to go in and hit. Wardsman is able to basically plug that gap. And Featherston is going to be stopped from exploiting it. But it's funny because after the battle, the division commander, William Ward, he takes credit for it. Oh, I led my men forward. We stopped Featherston. Everything is great. We saved the day. But those three brigade commanders say, no, he wasn't there. As a matter of fact, he was hammer drunk in the back. We, oh we ordered the charge forward. We were late because he was drunk. So we had to take initiative ourselves to move forward. We rushed to, to Redland Road to stop Featherston. We deserve the credit. So it's just it's one of those things. But at this moment, the rebels are in a complete state of confusion. They're firing in all kinds of directions. This echelon coordinated attack is completely foobar at this point. It's off the trails. They're all fighting. Every, every general is their own commanding general at this point in these brigades. The echelon attack is screwed up from the start right at the beginning. On Featherson's left was uh, another one of Loring's brigades under Thomas N. Scott. And he, made, he was made of Alabamians and a regiment from Louisiana. And they're going to discover a single regiment 500 yards ahead of the rest of the line on top of a hill, which is the 33rd New Jersey under Patrick Henry Jones, mm. John Geary's division. This regiment 
was known as the Mutinous 33rd. That was their nickname. Wow. And they, they got this nickname because when they it's actually when it was recruited, they recruited 902 men into this 33rd New Jersey, a huge regiment. As soon as they got their enlistment money, 244 of them took off and left. That's as so soon, bad. Oh my God. If they got their first paycheck and left, took wow. off. Hence the nickname, the Mutinous 33rd. That's, wow. that's how they got their nickname. Aren't they the guys that end up getting captured at this battle, though? They, 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 a lot, a lot of them do. Yeah. Peach, but at Peachtree Creek at this moment, they are going to be the target of Scott's Rebels Brigade here. Mm-hmm. They're going to be, they're, they're going to be the target. And the reason why they were so far ahead and by themselves is earlier in the day, the, uh, some rebels that were captured and brought to John Geary personally lied to his face and said, "No, there's no rebels around here. He's not the droid you're looking for." <laughs> oh if a, if a, some inexplicable reason. Geary believes them. And so he's quite surprised when he hears a Scots brigade attack on the New Jersey men who ran right through them. The only person who ravaged more men from the state of New Jersey than General, than General Thomas Scott was Snooky. That's how Snooky. bad they got destroyed. <laughs> now, Scott's men de- basically demanded the 33rd New Jersey's colors. And when they refused, they shot the color bearer and they took him. And they immediately took the high ground from these New Jersey men that they were holding. The commander of the 33rd, Lieutenant Colonel Enos Fornacht, he orders a full retreat or Operation GTFO. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and Scott's men are going to move forward over that Collier's Ridge. And they're going to run into Charles Candy's 1st Brigade and a 3rd Brigade under, guess who, David Ireland. That's who they're going to run into. Yep, Ireland's here, which is pretty cool. I So Ireland and Candy are going to launch a counterattack, and they're going to push Scott back pretty quickly, way past Tenure Branch Creek. They're going to move him right down. But while this rebel push under Loring is happening, the Union commander of the 20th Corps, Joseph Hooker himself, is going to ride up to the defensive line. He's going to plant the colors. He'll say, boys, I guess we'll stop here. That's what he says. He's showing leadership, personal leadership he is. Now, following Loring came the division of Edward Walthall, and one of his brigades under Edward O'Neill moved in. And after Scott fell back, people from Gettysburg to Edward O'Neill, from, you know, from uh, Oak Ridge, but he's yep. gonna he's gonna he's gonna fight really really well here. O'Neill is gonna hit the right of Geary's line, which was held by the Irishman Patrick Henry Jones, the brigade of New Yorkers and Pennsylvania, as well as the 33rd New Jersey, right. Jones had his line ready and was holding the high ground on Collier's Ridge, and it was supported on his left by a man with the greatest facial hair in the Civil War. Alpheus Alpheus Williams. Williams. Alpheus Williams, okay? And I will die on that hill. No one will deny me the the right that he has the best facial hair in the Civil War, right? So about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, O'Neill's Alabamans and Mississippi men, they're going to be five deep. And they're going to hit Jones' brigade, and they're going to quickly get around Geary's right, and they're going to drive Jones' men back. So again, even though the echelon attack on the right was a disaster, it's sort of working on the left now. Stevenson's men is, are, are having a lot of success, where mm-hmm. Hardy's men was a complete disaster. They, they're going to Geary's guys are going to fall back, and they're going to reform, um, and they're going to stop. They're going to stop Edward Neal's breakthrough, and Alpheus Williams' men are going to start to arrive on Geary's right, causing O'Neill to, to disappear. So Williams is late, but he gets there just in time. The Union line's holding at this point. It's doing really, really well. This is similar to Ambrose Wright, speaking of Gettysburg, where Ever O'Neill had punched a hole through the Union line, and he looked around to see uh, to see who was supporting him on his right, and there was nobody there. Yeah. So he couldn't hold it. He had to fall back. P- the Battle of Peachtree Creek at this point is going to degenerate into basically a long-distance battle musket battle back and forth yep. as, as neither side really attempted to advance again they just kind of stared at each other and fired you're just gonna stare yeah the rebs did make one last attempt as the, the rebs got around williams rear and they're gonna run into the 123rd new york who a guy under uh, joseph knipes brigade and they're kind of sitting hanging out chilling resting because they were in reserve and yeah the New Yorkers are talking about how they're going to be waltzing into Atlanta. This is going to be great. This is this is easy. And that very is that kind moment, of like when they want to win the World Series. 
Oh yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they're going to be kind of hanging out there when O'Neill's men are going to get around them and attack them unsuspectingly, and they're going to be stunned. But then, but O'Neill's guys are going to get pushed back. They're too far forward. They have no support. But they punched the line and they held it for a little bit of time. But there was no support. So 6 p.m. daylight's disappearing now. The shooting is sporadic. It's starting to slowly disappear. The Battle of Peachtree Creek is is basically winding down, and the Rebs have really failed to break the Union line and hold it. And Hood is realizing that he's about to suffer a very embarrassing defeat on his first day as yes. commander of the Army of Tennessee. And so you can imagine Hood's his Hood's attitude here at this moment. Well, this, considering this he doesn't even want the job um, to begin with, um, which is, you know, if that's that's one of the stories is he didn't want it like i can't imagine how he's feeling right now um you know general well, i'll Tom, tell you how he's feeling uh, i'll tell you how he's feeling boy he's yes. pissed he's mad at you and i take the last beer that's how pissed he is i don't get mad at you he was livid that his men were not able to break through and he went off on his subordinates basically that not all of his generals got into the fight it was mismanaged in the beginning the orders were clear Bait got lost. Manny sat around and did nothing. No one attacked. The Rose was he, clown was there. Oh, that's probably what it was. Hood planned to attack, like I said, with seven divisions. But instead of seven divisions, he fought with seven brigades. That's all he ended up fighting with. When you factor in Bait, you factor in Claiborne, who never got into the fight. He's like oh. having your best bat on the bench and never bringing him in. Well, because he was supposed. To- Sorry, go ahead. He was supposed to be the one who took advantage of the gap, and he ne- he never got in. So oh. when you're supposed to fight with seven divisions against four, now you've got seven brigades against four divisions in an entrenched defensive position. You don't need to be a military West Point genius to know. You don't need Miss Cleo to tell you the future of this one, Mary. Right? That's exactly what happens. Bates, got, Bates gets lost. May, Manny's men don't do anything to move forward. Oh, Samuel French, by the way. They didn't move forward at all. They just they never they never even got off their asses. And again, Patrick Claiborne never gets into the fight, which is astounding. You know who Hood's mad at the most? I can't William, even imagine. Will, William Hardy, of course. Yeah. Saying that he didn't fight as hard as Alex Stewart, which was true. Stewart's men fought their asses off at Peachtree Creek. Yep. Hardy's men didn't. For whatever reason, he didn't. Hardy also put his divisions in piecemeal. And he knew that the attack on the rebel right, it was half as strong as the one on the rebel left. Hood realized he probably wins. But by the time that Stewart's men got into the fight, they were fighting the army, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the strength of the Union army, were, who were not weakened at that point. No. And they were, I mean, I would not underestimate George Henry Thomas because he is, Army of the Cumberland is probably one of the stronger armies that you have in what sherman has now claiborne did get a message from hood hood sent him an urgent message because he had been like he was gonna attack and the hood's like don't and i'm sure claiborne was like what the hell like what what is going on here um around four o'clock or around at one point general thomas is gonna send sherman a message that says hood attacked me in full force about 4 p.m and has persisted until now attacking very fiercely but he was repulsed handsomely by the troops all along my line so those troops you know are like they are fighting so hard and that's the impression that you know you if you read howard's account of it in his memoirs Mm -hmm. he just talks about how hard those guys fought at peachtree creek like it's just this like relentless like they're he was like and then they did this and then they then they did that and they repulsed this attack and at one point you know, they thought they were going to get swept and then they, they fought back again. So it's, it's very much a hard fighting battle. It, it was. And of course, while the battle's going on, Sherman's proud watching his men. Actually, no, he didn't. You know why? He's with Sherman. Schofield. He didn't know the battle was even happening. No, he didn't. Afterwards. And he's sending all these messages. He's telling like at one, at one point he sends a message at 3 25 PM to Thomas being like, you can take the city of Atlanta. And Thomas is like, I'm in a friggin' battle, dude. Stop. <laughs> he's he's over there. He's with McPherson. He's east of Atlanta. He doesn't know what's happening. But I mean, he must have been happy though, right? No, he wasn't. He was pissed off yeah. because while Hood was engaged with Thomas, 
neither Schofield nor McPherson marched into Atlanta to take the city while they were fighting north of it. Yeah. And he he was pretty pissed off at that. But but here's the thing though. Not sure how he could be mad when Sherman didn't know about the battle anyway, but no. also he never ordered them to do it. They're not just going to march in on their own. And that and that's the thing too is when you look at the opportunity John Bell Hood had when Sherman doesn't even know the battle's even happening, he has a chance to defeat the largest part of his army north of the city and really screw up Sherman's plans to take Atlanta but because of Confederate mismanagement by his underlings. It gets completely screwed up. The Battle of Peachtree Creek was one that Hood's plan was very, very good, but the execution was terrible. And this is going to be the opening act of the final struggle of Atlanta. And this was the Confederates' best chance. By far to hold the city, it was their best chance. Yeah. Robert, Robert D. Jenkins, in his book, The Battle of Peachtree Creek, he, in his quote, he writes, The beginning of the war for the Deep South in the Confederacy, the beginning of the end of the war for the, for the Deep South in the Confederacy, Peachtree Creek was the first nail in the coffin of Atlanta and the Confederacy. Peachtree Creek, again, was followed up by Confederate losses at Ezra Church, Jonesboro, and Decatur, culminating in the fall of Atlanta on September 2nd of 1864. Yeah. Okay. Now, he said of Hood at the battle, again, he said, this is, this is in Jenkins' book, Hood demonstrated his good skill in planning, but it would display a Failure to grasp the logistic requirements needed to make it a success, which is kind of what Lee said about him, about how his weaknesses were, right? Yeah. A, a rebel win at Peachtree Creek would have gone a long way in helping Hood hold Atlanta. But in the end, it doesn't mean he would have, but it would have been a big part to help. But yeah. in the end, it was a disaster. And Hood had to, I mean, Davis had to know it. He had to know it. The, the battle cost the Army of Tennessee 2,500 men. And if you wonder, was Davis having a little bit of buyer's remorse about his decision to put in Hood? Remorse. Well, I'm, I'm just saying because after the battle, and this there's some great passive-aggressive quotes after this battle. Uh -huh. After the battle, Davis is speaking to a group in Macon, Georgia. And he says, and again, this is Davis with his quotes, I put a man in command who I knew would strike an honestly and manly blow for the city and many a Yankee's blood was made to nourish the soil before the prize was won. And in the crowd was Joseph E. Johnston hearing this, who later for the rest of his life referred to Hood sarcastically as the striker of manly blows. That's what he called him going forward. That is so passive. Wow. And he, he was not, and he was obviously That's so not passive happy. aggressive. He was not happy about the Confederate loss, but you have to wonder if part of him was laughing on the inside because oh. he knew, because he knew that he was the wrong guy at the wrong time. But the, in, in Hood's defense, and again, this is in Hood's defense, it should have worked. It should have worked because if he attacked right, kind of like Spring Hill kind of like franklin and we've been critical on hood here we have on certain things we were nice to him with Gaines mill right, like because right. he doesn't have that well, you call it straight but in hood's defense if hardy had did what he was supposed to do here yeah this is a difference this is a whole different story oh, but again it didn't, it didn't work out but the, at the end of the day the buck stops here and he is put in charge to fight offensive and responsible he has a reputation of being over aggressive flying by the seat of his pants and whatever Hardy was doing, who the hell knows, but it really echoed that point. And at the end of the day, the battle of Peachtree Creek blew up in the Confederates face and it puts egg on hood's face, ultimately cost him the city of Atlanta in the big picture. It's going to eventually do that. And it's real kind of, I don't know if I want to call this ironic or not, but at 11 o'clock on the evening of July the 20th, hood is going to send a message to Richmond at three o'clock today, a portion of Hardy's and Stewart's corps drive the en drove the enemy into the breastworks, but did not gain possession of them. Our loss slight. Let's see how that ages. It does not age very well, but I get it. He's trying to put on this whole thing like he's new to command. Like this is kind of like me at Gettysburg, new to command. And this is something, you know, also to compare to a union guy like me, Hood you know, from what I've read, I don't know if he really wanted this command or not. He's 33 years old here, right? He's, he's young. Um, and that's not saying that age 
matters with this at all. But this is like, you know, he's taking a plan. And as you said, you know, there's com miscommunication <coughs> that is causing issues. Hardy really does not do well here. And perhaps the best guy, Claiborne, is is held back. And I know there's some that would probably disagree about that. But like, you know, how might it have gone if Claiborne had been thrown in first? Maybe the well, same. I, mean, I don't know. Like if the plan had if the plan had worked the way it was intended to, bait hits, you know, bait hits where he's supposed to, it goes right down the line. There's gonna be a break somewhere down the line. I mean, they the the Confederates broke the Union line even without with with Hardy's Hardy's men really not doing what they were supposed to do. Claiborne's gonna go in and break that gap and he's gonna do it and he's gonna smash right through them. And that's probably what would have happened. But again, it, it it just didn't. It just didn't. So you know, sometimes you look at John Bell Hood as kind of like Charlie Brown in the football. Yeah. You know, he 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 you know, he he has the best intentions. He has good plans, but at the end of the day, the execution from his subordinates, whether whether it be Cheatham, Spring Hill, you know, whether it be whether it be um, Hardy here, there's always somebody who doesn't do their job. And again, it's just it's just one of those things. Is a bad luck? Is a bad communication? Is it the fact that some of these guys don't like Hood? We'll never know, but it's just a constant with him. And he comes up with these really good plans to attack, but somewhere along the way, somebody screws up and foils it, and he always falls back yeah. on him. But that's what. But when you take the big chair, you got to take the good and the bad and the ugly. It just seems like it falls back on him. Yeah. And again, that's just the way Peachtree Creek is, and it, it's a great what if for the Confederacy. Now, if play the what if game let's suppose hood does break the line and force them back what are they going to do they can't they go can... back across the chattahoochee because sherman has gone he's cried like you know basically like right. i said earlier that the chattahoochee is like the rubicon at that point for him he can't go back at that point right so it's tough to say but he would have right off the bat if he has a big victory there well now you now the morale's up again well now we yeah. get a guy who's a fighter now it's lee at the seven days coming off of johnson at the peninsula we got a guy who fights now. Maybe there's that that happens. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't work out for them. And, and unfortunately for the Confederacy and, and John Bell Hood, this is this is a stain on his record that's going to stick with him. And again, it's going to reinforce the fact that he's aggressive. He loses a lot of men. And, and really, it's a, it's a battle that probably should have been better. But at, but at the end of the day, that's that that's what happens. You know, yeah. communication, terrain, weather. This one was miscommunication. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. And, and Howard in his memoirs, he, like I said, go read his, like what he writes about Peachtree Creek, because it's really good. He said, thus ended in defeat Hood's execution of Johnston's plan for a general battle at Peachtree Creek. And he goes on to say, we had a great impulse of joy because we had won the battle. The Confederates had at this time, besides the affliction of death, a great sense of chagrin because they had lost. And that's how he he ends it right there. And you can see he's quite happy that they've won the battle. My own thoughts on Hood are that he is he's really, really good, you know, up until Gettysburg. He's really, really good. And even after that at Chickamauga, he's still good, but he gets that wound. And I think that's what slows him down. But I also think it's kind of like um, Ambrose Burnside on the Union side. As commander of an army, he is kind of in over his head and there are some people that just are not suited for that and i do think john bell hood is one of those guys he's good in the lower commands where he is someone true above him. true but but yeah. counterpoint you could be the best football coach in the world if your quarterback sucks and you can't make plays you know oh, yeah, your win. subordinates so so you, you you really depend on that and i think hood's somewhere in between i think yeah. his plan of Peachtree was really really strong it was but the execution was really, really bad. And they were that close. They were that yeah. close. And I think they that does go back to the subordinates and a, as a, kind of a level of respect. And it's just kind of the story of Army of Tennessee, too, that this is how it's been, especially since Shiloh going back that far. Mm -hmm. It's been you look at Braxton Bragg in command and trying to oust him. Hardy's involved in that. You know, Joseph E. Johnston, you kind of see a little bit more, I think, peace or whatever if you want to call it that but then he gets removed and it gets thrown back into this kind of instability again yeah it's, it's true but it's definitely a definitely missed opportunity for the confederate so what's coming up for us next mary 
Well, before we end the episode, I do want to talk about one really cool piece of trivia I found. And that oh, is okay. that a soldier from the 19th Michigan, he found a female soldier um, oh, wow. at okay. this battle. Um, and she had been wounded. She was alive when they found her and she'd been wounded. Um, and there was also rumors that there was two other female soldiers that had been captured by Union troops at this battle. I just thought that was a really cool um, piece of trivia that um, I found about this battle. Um, another one, um, I found a quote from Emerson Opdyke, and he said, I have never seen the dead rebels lie so thickly strewn upon the ground since the Battle of Shiloh, um, yeah. in reference to Peachtree Creek. Um, and another soldier from the 70th Indiana, we have fought the battle of this campaign and given the enemy the soundest thrashing they have had yet. Um, and then Major Thomas McGuire from Loring's division, it was a shocking loss of life without any results. We miss General Johnson so much. He would have retreated to Macon rather than make such a sacrifice. And that tells that tells a story. It goes versus off playing offense versus defense. So, and so it's just definitely definitely ones that definitely consider. So, are we so, done? Yes. Next up for us, um, we are going to be talking <laughs> about the Battle of Ream Station. And then after that, we are going to be coming back to this, um, to the Western Theater, to the Atlanta campaign, um, to talk about the Battle of Jonesboro, which is kind of that battle that really settles it. That that means the Union is finally going to take the city of Atlanta. Soon, two days after the Battle of Peachtree Creek is fought, the Battle of Atlanta will be fought, and General James Burbsey McPherson will be killed. Um, and then on July 27th, General Oliver Otis Howard will take command of the Army of the Tennessee. And then you have some more battles happening in the Atlanta campaign as well. But we will yeah, be a back. Of, Sorry, a, lot train, a lot of train is coming. So yeah. battle, battle, Ream Station coming up. We're going to talk about old Winnie Boy, and then we'll get to Jonesboro. And we're going to talk about Patrick Claiborne, who does finally get into action in this. So, all right. Yeah. So any final words from you there, Fincher, before we sign off and go to the great beyond well, thank you for bringing it like you always do. Thank you to all our listeners ah. for supporting us for these 133 episodes. And we will be back with y'all next week or no, two weeks from now with another yep. episode. Yep. And one last thing we got to say, we got to say thoughts and prayers for our friend Pete, Pete Carmichael, unfortunately yes. died this yes. past weekend. Uh, he was a friend of ours, a friend of a podcast. So he'll be missed tremendously, a huge loss to the civil war community. So our thoughts and prayers with his family and, um, and hopefully, uh, Hopefully he's he's in a better place. So yes, he was a great guy, and we were happy to know him as a friend to get to meet him and all that. So yeah, huge loss to the Civil War community. A, a huge loss. So all right, so off we go, Mary. Again, we have a great weekend. We'll talk to you all as they say on the other side. See y'all later. Peace Bye. out. Bye.